Let's look at the 2014 paper. 2013 one. There we go. 2014. Capacitive capacitance. Um, 330 microfarads is charged from a 40 volt supply. How much charge is stored in the capacitor? We just do Q equals CV. Um, there'll be a mark for that. Q equals, the only mistake people are going to make here is to forget that by 10 to the minus 6. And multiply it by 40 and that gives you 0 0.0132 coulombs. Okay, and a mark for your answer. What would be the maximum energy stored by this capacitor? I would probably use the half CV square, but we've got the charge up there. You could use it or any other um, equation that works because we know all three things about the capacitor now. So a half the capacitance was 330 by 10 to the minus 6 multiplied by the voltage, which is 40. Don't forget the square. Really easy to do there. People do that with this one and the, a half MV square for some reason. And then the energy is 0.264 joules okay um nice easy four marks i would say there for a a level paper not so nice um figure 3.1 shows a network of capacitors each of capacitance 330 calculate the capacitance between a and b so what we have to do is evaluate each of these branches um first so Along that branch, so each of those series branches, we have to do 1 over C2 equals 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2, which is equal to 1 over 330 plus 1 over 330. And you can see what this does here because they're down. They go 1 over C2 equals 2 over 330. So CT will be 330 divided by 2, which is... Just going to do that, 165. Um, but we have that rule and you can just apply it. There's no marks working out for this bit here. If there's two identical capacitors in series, the capacitance of the to total capacitance will be half of the individual capacitors. And that includes, so we're gonna put each of these um, together. So this one will be 330 microfarads. This one here will be 165, and we're going to divide that by 3, because there's 3 of them in series. And that bottom capacitor, the total capacitance of it, would be 110. Now, that then is 3 capacitors in parallel, and if capacitors are in parallel, we just add them together. So it's going to be 110 plus 165 plus 330, and should give you... Um, 600 and 5, isn't it? Just check. Yeah, 605 microfarads. Okay, so break it down into those smaller steps, and the smaller steps are easier than trying to think of it all at once. Um, next one. Figure 3.2 shows a circuit containing a capacitor of capacitance C, a resistor of resistance R, and a supply voltage Vs and two switches S1 and S2. When switch S1 is closed, the capacitor is charged by a battery. Explain how the capacitor is charged in terms of the movement of charge. So when this switch is closed, our capacitor charges up. How does it charge up? Well, Conventional current goes this way, but it wants us to talk about the movement of charge. So we're talking about electrons, and we always take them to move the opposite direction that um, the current flows. So what we're going to end up with here is electrons get added to that plate, okay, from the um, the negative terminal of our power supply. But what that buildup of negative charge does is it repels the negative charge on this side. So it repels the electrons over here. So these electrons then move this way along the circuit to the positive terminal of our power supply. Now, 
initially that was uncharged, but because those electrons leave, the positive charge will remain making that plate positively charged. So that plate doesn't become positively charged because it gains positive charge. It becomes positively charged because it's lost electrons, it's lost negative charge. So um, two marks here. First one is for describing that electrons flow from capacitor plate to the positive terminal of the battery. I mean, I would have given the second point first, but this is the way it is in the mark scheme. Um, yeah, and flow from the negative plate Sorry, from the negative terminal of the battery to the other plate or the negative plate. And they'll keep doing that until the voltage across the capacitor is equal to that of the supply. Okay, so until those two things balance out, so the push, trying to push the charge onto the capacitor is kind of cancelled out by the push from that buildup of charge on the capacitor. So figure 3.1, um, on figure 3.1, sketch graph to show how the potential voltage across the capacitor plates vary with time during the charging process. Um, switch S1 is closed at time T naught. Um, so we want to show um, how the voltage rises on this. Not a great question um, because it will rise almost instantly. I mean, there might be a small amount of resistance in those wires. Um, but I mean, feasibly, there's no scale um, on this axis for start, so time. But it could just go almost straight up and then across. Um, is what would happen if there was no resistance in the wires. But essentially, the voltage is going to rise and continue to rise until it gets level with that supply voltage. So it won't get any higher than that supply but it will get very, very close to it. Initially, it will rise very fast because there's no charge on the capacitor first, so it's easy to add the charge, which increases the voltage, but it gets harder to push more charge on as that voltage increases. Um, capacitors charge a maximum potential difference. Switch S1 is open, switch S2 is then closed, and it discharges through the resistor R, and the potential difference across the capacitor decreases with time. Um, what effect does the resistor have on the discharging capacitor? It opposes the flow of current, so it um, slows the rate of discharge. So it will increase the amount of time it takes for the capacitor to discharge. Um, define the time constant. Well, it is just, um, it's a time, so it's a time taken for what to happen um, for the voltage to fall to 1 over E of its previous or initial value. Now there's two ways of doing this next bit. A 470 microfarad capacitor is charged a potential difference of 200. The capacitor is discharged through a resistor R after 12 seconds. So V0 is equal to 200 volts. We'll do this both ways. Um, after a time of 12 seconds, the voltage has fallen to 74 volts. And to find that resistance, we're first going to have to find out what our time constant is. So I can do V equals V naught E to the minus T over tau. Get your V's the right way around. Okay, 
divide by the 200, take natural logs, and that will allow us to get rid of the E and bring the, um, let me do that step actually just to show you. So we have natural log E to the minus 12 over tau, get my tau's and my t's mixed up. Um, we can bring down the minus 12 over tau, and then natural log e is just equal to 1, so it cancels out. So we we end up with this, and if we do 74 divided by 200, natural log of that gives us minus 0 0.9943 is equal to minus 12 over tau. Rearranging that gives us that... Um, Now, this is slightly more accurate, is 12.1 um, seconds. But what we can notice from these values is 1 over e times 200 roughly equals 74. Okay, therefore, that time taken for it to drop from 200 to 74 must be the time constant. And just by noticing that, you can get the tau is 12 seconds and that is what they, the way they expect you to do this question but both these ways would be marked correctly what we can then do is take that value and put it into our equation for the time constant we'll just take the 12 equals 470 by 10 to the minus 6 times r r equals 12 divided by 470 by 10 to the minus 6 which gives you a resistance of 25.5 by 10 to the 3 now it wants it in kilo ohms, so you have to be very careful that you remove that by 10 to the 3 in there. Okay.